أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجه وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح العالمين اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين. For the hastening of the reappearance of the Master, the Savior, the Avenger, Al Hujjat ibn Al Hasan Al Askari, recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When it comes to the virtues of the commander of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib, there is an important caveat to keep in mind. And that is that his merits, his characteristics, his virtues are often exclusive in nature. Bear with me for a moment because this will give you an important key to not only detecting and understanding the unparalleled qualities of Amir al Mu'mineen, but also truly appreciating them. His virtues are exclusive, which means that they have a tendency to negate those qualities and features from being possessed by other people. In other words, Amir al Mu'mineen wasn't just a pioneer when it came to characterizing and fulfilling the unique features that he had. He wasn't just a step ahead of everybody else. Rather, he possessed the majority of his qualities to the negation of other people, meaning that no one else possessed those qualities. And it was clearly demonstrated through his actions that the features that he possessed were non-existent in others. Allow me to demonstrate. I'll ask you a question that I want you to think about. It won't take too much processing. But if I asked you who the most courageous person was, you're thinking of someone, but before you answer the question, allow me to set the stage. 
We have to acknowledge that bravery and courage are merits and virtues in and of themselves. Meaning that regardless of religious affiliation, regardless of who possesses courage, it is a trait that we all admire and respect. Much like generosity, compassion, honesty, right? It doesn't matter who possesses these qualities, whether this person is a Muslim or a non-Muslim, simply exhibiting qualities like courage, honesty, compassion, kindness, is something that is universally admired. True? Now, that being said, Mecca boasted some of the bravest people in the Arabian Peninsula and possibly the world. Some of these names you might be familiar with, others not so much. But you have people like Hanzalat ibn Abi Sufyan. He was a paragon of bravery. He was admired by everyone within the Arab tribes of the Arabian Peninsula. Shayba, Utba, these people were known for their unparalleled courage. Another example, a name that you are familiar with, is Amr ibn Wid al Amri. Amr ibn Wid was so brave that, picture the scene, he'd be sitting with some of his friends in the morning, eating breakfast. Then he would get up and walk away. They'd say to him, where are you headed off to? He would say, oh, I'm just going on a conquest to a war, an expedition against a particular tribe. He would go single-handedly defeat that tribe in battle, then come back in the afternoon carrying their possessions as his personal booty. Just one man fighting an entire tribe of warriors. This was Amr ibn Wid al-Amiri. They used to call him Faris Yalyal because in one battle, he faced an enemy that was a thousand man strong by himself. It's very difficult to picture this. It's the stuff of legends, right? Heroes in modern movies can't be depicted in such a manner. But he would face a thousand men, defeat all of them, take their possessions, and go back home to feast. Now this was Mecca. As for Medina, there were people like Harith al-Khaybari, as well as his brother, who was known as the one who defended the fortified complex of Khaybar. Right? These two brothers, Harith and Marhab, they were known once again for their bravery. And so that is a virtue that people naturally respect and admire. They were great warriors. They were brave men who did not fear the enemy, no matter how large, no matter how strong. Now, all of these names that I mentioned, they share two common traits. Number one, their legendary courage. And number two, they were all slain at the hands of Ali ibn Abi Talib, Asadullah al Ghalib, Imam al Muttaqeen, Ya'sub al Deen, Asadullah wa Asadu Rasulah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The bravest of men could not stand in the face of Ali. His courage was not just a portion above other people. It's not that others were also brave within the camp of Muslims. Ali was unique. Ali was different, distinguished in all of his qualities. As I said, exclusive to him. 
I'll give you a couple of examples with some nuances and details that often get skimmed over in lectures and sermons. But I think they're critically important in understanding this point about the virtues of Amir al-Mu'mineen. The first is in the Battle of Ahzab, otherwise known as the Battle of Khandaq. Why is it called Khandaq? Because a Khandaq refers to a moat. And when all of the pagan tribes came together as a united force to attack Muslims in Medina, led by none other than Abu Sufyan, Shams ibn Harb, the father of Muawiyah. All the tribes gathered and they decided to collectively launch a decisive war against the fledgling Muslim community. Salman said to the Holy Prophet that I suggest we dig a moat around the city. At the very least, around our weak spots so that the enemy cannot advance into the holy city when they initiate their ambush. So they dug a moat, they filled it with fire as a means to fortify the city. The Muslims were so afraid that the Quran describes this moment in history in vivid detail. When you read the verses in Surah Al-Ahzab, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the emotional state of the Muslims, you will get a glimpse of just how much fear had taken over them. Obviously, they had the likes of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And that should have given comfort and solace to the believers, but not the disbelievers, not the hypocrites. Amir al-Mu'mineen, once again, his bravery, everyone was familiar with it. In fact, they mention a person by the name of Dhirar ibn al-Khattab. He was one of the enemy forces. He came forward and he was faced with Amir al-Mu'mineen. Whether there was an actual battle between them, an actual duel, we don't know. But Ali ibn Abi Talib approached him. So he quickly fled the scene. He ran off. Now this man was also respected and recognized and was supposedly a brave man. So they asked him, they said, لِمَ فَرَرْتَ مِنْ Ali? Why did you run away from him? Listen to what he said. He said, when I saw his face, It's as if I saw death showing and revealing its face to me. I knew that facing Ali ibn Abi Talib means certain death. No question about it. So I ran off. Now, some of these details you need to pay close attention to. Amr ibn Awid. Now, the Muslims are now surrounded. All these Arab tribes, the pagans, have completely sealed off the city of Medina. They're about to ambush, but they're prevented by the moat. The moat was in fact very wide. And so they couldn't, and there was fire inside, they couldn't just jump over it. Some of them attempted to jump over the moat, only to fall to their death inside the moat. Who was brave enough to attempt this? It was Amr ibn Wid. Amr, being the brave risk taker that he was, being Faris Yalyal that he was, being a man who would face a thousand armed warriors that he was, he also had an incredibly strong and fast horse. So he jumped over the, the moat and made it safely on the other side. When he jumped over, you can imagine the fear that many of the Muslims had was now amplified. Amr made it. It's not just any random person, but Amr ibn Dawud. So he came forward 
And he began calling out and challenging people to come and face him. What Amr did, in my view, was humiliate the Muslim army. Why? Because he came and said, would anyone come and face me? I challenge you to come and fight me. He kept saying it over and over again to the point where he said these, this poetry, this poem. He said, وَلَقَدْ بُحَحْتُ مِنَ النِّدَاءِ بِجَمْعِكُمْ هَلْ مِنْ مُبَارِزِ He said, my voice has gone hoarse. I've been screaming out off the top of my lung. Would anyone come and face me? هَلْ مِنْ مُبَارِزِ وَوَقَفْتُ إِذْ جَبُنَ الْمُشَجْعُ وَقْفَةَ الرَّجُلِ الْمُنَاجِزِ He said, I'm standing before you. I'm willing to fight you. Don't you have anyone with a modicum of courage to come and face me? To make matters even worse, Amr ibn Wid, this is where I believe, was the apex of humiliation. He said, أَمَا تَزْعُمُونَ أَنَّ الْمَقْتُولَ مِنْكُمْ يَرِدُ الْجَنَّةِ وَأَنَّ الَّذِي تَقْتُلُونَهُ يَرِدُ النَّارِ Don't you claim that if you are killed in battle, you will go to heaven. And that if you kill one of us, this person, meaning himself, will go to hell. So is there no one who wants to go to heaven? Is there none of you who can fight me and either get killed and end up in paradise or kill me and send me to hell? Come and fight me. Now, Everyone was sitting, according to some reports, Imagine if someone is in the park or on the beach and a bird sits on their head. They try not to move because the slightest movement will cause the bird to fly off. So historians describe the Muslims as people who were so still as if they had a bird sitting on their head in case their movement would be misconstrued as a gesture of responding to the call of Amr ibn Wid. In case somebody moved and the Prophet said, are you volunteering to go and fight? They stood still, their heads bowed down, not a breath. Al-Hakim Al-Hasakani, Al-Hakim Al-Naysaburi, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, other Sunni jurists and historians and narrators have stated that every time Amr ibn Wid issued the challenge, Amir al Mu'mineen would get up and say, Ana lahu ya Rasulullah. I'll go and fight him. Rasulullah would tell Ali ibn Abi Talib to sit back down. This is really important. Listen carefully. He would tell him to sit back down. Then the Prophet would encourage the believers to go and fight. He would say, Is there no one to go fight him? I will guarantee paradise for you. Is there anything more you'd want to be guaranteed entry into paradise? In other words, you fear death? Fine. Let's say the worst case scenario takes place. You die. I guarantee your entry into, into heaven. No one responded. On one occasion, and this hadith is in Bihar al-Anwar, the Holy Prophet said, مَنْ يُبَارِزُ عَمْرًا فَيَكُونُ الْخَلِيفَةَ مِنْ بَعْدِ who would go and fight Amr? For whoever does so, I will appoint him as my successor after me. Allahu Akbar. No one moved. Not a breath, not a shiver. Amir al Mu'mineen would get up again. Ana lahu ya Rasulullah. I can go and face him. The Prophet said, No, sit down. The third time, Abr ibn Uid. وَلَقَدْ بُحَحْتُ مِنَ النِّدَاءِ بِجَمْعِكُمْ هَلْ مِنْ مُبَارِزِ Amir al-Mu'mineen got up the third time. Rasulullah said to him, Ya Ali, إِنَّهُ Amr. This is Amr we're talking about. He's the stuff of legends. Everyone knows how strong and skilled and powerful and courageous and brave he is. The Imam responded by saying, وَأَنَا Ali, 
I know he's Amr, but I'm Ali. Now, this is important. Why? Because had Amir al Mu'mineen volunteered to go fight Amr the first time around, had Rasulullah permitted him to go and face Amr, later on, when they presented the story, they could simply say, Amr came. He challenged the Muslims, Amir al-Mu'mineen volunteered, he fought him, he killed him, end of discussion. Which says nothing about the lack of courage by the other companions. But when they're given the chance, not once, not twice, but thrice, to go and fight, and they refuse to do so, what does that tell you about them? What does that say about the courage of Ali? That it was exclusive. By the way, a question that might come up is the companions composed of people who were believers, people who were brave, as well as believers who were not brave, as well as downright hypocrites. What about the believers? Why didn't they stand up? Why didn't they volunteer to go fight? Surely the companions included the likes of Ammar, Miqdad, Salman, Abu Dhar, and others. What about them? Why was it just Ali who went to face Amr ibn Awid? The answer is that the hypocrites are over and done with. Right? These people were afraid of getting killed because their entire scheme was to wait out the time of Rasulullah as we explained in one of the lectures so that he would die and they could then take over Islam and restore society's values back to the pagan era. That was their entire plot. And so the last thing they wanted was to die. They were disbelievers. They didn't believe in God, in heaven, or hell. So that was a portion of the companions. They were hypocrites. Then you have the believers who were not courageous or brave. And the answer to that is quite obvious. They did lack the courage. They couldn't get up and face Amr ibn Awad. Yes, heaven is guaranteed. Yes, Rasulullah has promised so much. But I just can't do it. It's not in me. As for the ones who were courageous, true believers among the companions, the problem they had was that this was Amr ibn Awad. If you are facing, let's say, the Argentinian soccer team, would you even bother showing up to the match? You wouldn't. Because you don't want to go and end up coming back and the results are 17 nil and embarrass your family and your tribe and your community. Even the likes of Miqdad and Ammar and so forth. They knew they didn't have it in them to defeat Amr ibn Awad. So, in all likelihood, they expected to be killed. And they might have felt that that would bring shame and humiliation to the Muslims. It would dishearten the Muslims. It would demoralize the Muslims. If the Muslims were already so terrified of facing the pagans, imagine if the first person to go and fight their iconic warrior was killed. And so it wouldn't do any good for the Muslim community. So we're not doubting their faith or their belief or even their courage. It's just that they knew they didn't have it in them to fight Amr ibn Awad. The only one who did was Ali ibn Abi Talib. Once again, the context of this story, which is mentioned in Sunni books and reports, even prior to Shi'i books, the context tells you that Ali's courage was exclusive. He was brave to the exclusion of others. Not that he had 10% more bravery than everybody else. Keep that in mind. So, here's what happened. Listen to this. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he speaks about the incident in some detail in a report. He said that on that day when the Holy Prophet encouraged Muslims to go and fight, and Amr ibn Awid kept screaming, asking for someone to go and challenge him. The Imam says, لا يقدم عليه مقدم ولا يطمع فيه طامع. No one would present themselves. You know how children, 
they like to show themselves in front of their parents. When they have a play at school, kids often want to have their parents in the audience because they want their parents to see them. They want their parents to appreciate the skills that they have, the things that they've learned, right? And so everybody surely had a desire to demonstrate their skills before Rasulullah, but not when the enemy was Amr ibn Wad. The Imam says, لا يطمع فيه طامع. No one had the desire to demonstrate anything they had because they knew it was a, a losing battle. So the Imam came to the Holy Prophet and I'll read his actual words. He says, فَعَمَّمَنِي رَسُولُ الله. The Prophet took his own turban, which was referred to as a sahab What a beautiful name, the cloud. Rasulullah took off his own turban. Now let's just stop right there. Imagine, imagine, for argument's sake, that Rasulullah, forget the events prior to this, forget the events after, forget Amr ibn Awad, forget for Ahzab. Imagine if Rasulullah had taken his turban off and placed it atop the head of any other companion, especially one of their idols. Would we even hear the end of it? Rasulullah put his turban on the head of XYZ. We'd never hear the end of it. But Rasulullah took off his turban. He then wrapped it around my head, Amirul Mu'mineen says. In fact, he gives some vivid details. Bisabati akwar. He wrapped it around my head nine times. That was the length of the Prophet's turban. Wa'atani sayfahu hadha. The Imam showed his sword. He said, the Prophet gave me his own sword, Dhul Fiqar. فَخَرَجْتُ إِلَيْهِ And I came out to face Amr ibn Wid. وَنِسَاءُ أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ بَوَاكٍ إِشْفَاقًا عَلَيَّ مِنْ ابْنِ عَبْدِ Wid. He said, when I went out, everyone was observing the scene. The women of Medina began crying. Out of sympathy with Amir al Mu'mineen. This young man, he has his old life ahead of him. He's going to face Ibn Abdiwid al Amiri, which means they all feared that he'd be killed. He's facing certain death. Ishfaqan alayya min Ibn Abdiwid. Amir al Mu'mineen, listen to this. He began walking towards Amr ibn Wid. I read out the poem of Amr early on when he said, Why is there anyone, no one to fight me? Amir al Mu'mineen now responded to him once again in verse. He said, لا تعجلن فقد أتاك مجيب صوتك غير عاجز. I mean, this is Ali ibn Abi Talib we're talking about. Not only is the poem so exhilaratingly beautiful, the Imam uses the same rhythm as the poem of Amr ibn Wid. So Amr ibn Wid would say, وَلَقَدْ بُحَحْتُ مَنَ النِّدَاءِ بِجَمْعِكُمْ هَلْ مِنْ مُبَارِزْ The Imam responds by saying, لا تعجلن فقد أتاك مجيب صوتك غير عاجز. He's saying to him, don't be hasty. Wait, I'm responding to your call. In other words, you thought you were going to defeat us. Just give me a moment. I'm reaching you not right now. I'm not weak. I'm not incapacitated. Just wait a moment. The Prophet waited in order to demonstrate the bravery of Ali and his superiority. It's not that we're weak or we lack courage. I have pure intentions. I have incredible foresight. Truth will save those who triumph. Just wait a moment. I'm about to make people cry in your funeral. I will strike you with my sword that will echo throughout the generations. Allahu Akbar. Amir al Mu'mineen proceeded forward. The hadith says, The Imam would constantly glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. I'd imagine that with every Allahu Akbar, Amir al-Mu'mineen was saying, the heart of Amr ibn Wid would tremble. 
Al-Hakim al-Hasakani, who was a Sunni historian, he narrates the story like this. He says that Amir al-Mu'mineen came to Amr ibn Wud. The first thing he did to him was the Imam said, imagine the Imam is uh, walking, he doesn't have a ride, he doesn't have a horse. Amr is sitting on top of that incredibly legendary horse which jumped over the moat. The Imam looked at him, he said to him, Man ant? Amr ibn Wud said to him, I never thought I would see the day when someone doesn't recognize me. Obviously, Ali ibn Abi Talib knew who it was. Rasulullah had told him, he had seen him. But the Imam's trying to break his spirit. It's like, I don't, I don't even know who you are. Man ant? Amr broke a little. Then he said, Ana Amr ibn Wid. Then he said to the Imam, Woman ant, who are you? The Imam said, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Amr immediately began to think of all the stories he'd heard about Ali in Badr and Uhud. All those scenes began rolling through his head. So in one report of Hakim al-Hasakani, he said to him, oh, you're the child that I used to see in your father's lap. Your father was a friend of mine. Are you that kid? Again, trying to belittle the Imam. The Imam said to him, yes, I am. He said, well, your father was a friend of mine. Inni la'akrahu an aqtulak. I would hate to kill you. The Imam said to him, Inni wallahi la'akrahu an aqtulak. As for me, I don't care. I wish to kill you. I don't have any qualms or reservations about killing you. In another report, he said this to him. Amr said to the Imam, he said, غَيْرُكَ يَبْنَ أَخِي my son, my nephew, again, he's trying to appease to the Imam. He said to him, maybe there's somebody else who can come and fight me. You have uncles who are older than you, more established fighters and warriors. Let the, one of them come and fight me. For I would hate to spill your blood. The Imam said to him, Lakinni wallahi la akrahu an uhriqa damak. As for me, by God, I have no issues with spilling your blood. Amr became furious. When the Imam said this, he got off, he jumped off the back of his horse. He unsheathed his sword. Historians describe that moment, the sword looking like a flame of fire. Many of the reports mention that Amir al-Mu'mineen, when he faced Amr, Amr is now willing to fight the Imam. The Imam said to him, I have heard that you have made a vow near the Kaaba. Once, Amr ibn Wit, for one reason or another, maybe to display his chivalry, he made a vow next to the Kaaba that if anyone offers me three choices, I will accept at least one of them. So the Imam said to him, I've heard you do this. He said, sure. The Imam said that I give you three options to choose from. The first is that you become a Muslim. Allahu Akbar. Sallallahu alayka ya Abul Hasan. At every moment in his life, the Imam is trying to guide people. He knows he can send Amr ibn Wid to the bottom of hell. He knows he can kill the people in, Saf in Safin, in Jamal, in Nahrawan. But the Imam's role is to guide people, not to kill them. You've all heard the story when in Safin, the Imam saw that Malik al-Ashtar was exhausted from fighting. He said to him, Malik, how many people have you killed today? He said, 500 people, Ya Amir al mumineen The Imam said, I also killed 500 people. And so it seemed a bit odd that both Ali ibn Abi Talib and his student would each kill 500 people. And so the Imam said, no, O Malik, when you kill someone, you kill any random fighter that comes your way. As for me, I look into their lineage down to seven generations. If there is anyone who's worthy of being kept alive, 
If, if there is anyone who's going to possess faith and be a good man, I spare that individual. In other words, I'm very selective about who I fight. The Imam is trying to guide, he's trying to lead. He's not in the business of just killing people in spite of his unparalleled courage. So the Imam said to him, the first choice is that you become a Muslim. He said, absolutely not. The hubris, the arrogance was too much for him to simply surrender and become a Muslim. The Prophet said to him, then the second choice is that you simply go back. He said, absolutely not. Everyone will say, I was a coward, I didn't fight you. He said, then the third choice that I'd like to present to you is you are riding on the back of a horse while I am a foot soldier. And that's not a fair fight. So he got off the back of his horse and using that sword, which looked like a flame, he cut off the arms and legs of his horse. In other words, there is, this is the point of no return. I'm not going back. There, I've just killed my horse. Let's face each other. Now, Ibn Abi al-Hadid, the Sunni Mu'tazilite, commentator on Nahj al-Balagha, he makes a lot of interesting points. One of them is this. He says, when Amr said to Ali ibn Abi Talib that I don't wish to fight you, I don't want to spill your blood. Wallah ma amarahu bir ruju'i ibqa'an alayh. He wasn't sympathetic towards Ali or he wanted to preserve his life. Bal khawfan minh faqad arafa qatlah bi badrin wa uhud. He was terrified of Ali. He knows who Ali ibn Abi Talib had killed in Badr and Uhud. And so the fight began. When the battle erupted, Amr first struck his sword on Ali's head, hitting the crown, causing blood to gush out of the Imam's head. In fact, they say that the strike of the accursed Abdul Rahman ibn Muljam came on the wound of the strike of Amr ibn Wid al Amri in the Battle of Ahzab. And so it was more tender, it was more vulnerable. So Amr ibn Wid struck Ali ibn Abi Talib, the blood gushed. Then the battle ensued. There was a dust of cloud. Imagine Muslims are terrified beyond description. Women are crying. The enemy is rejoicing. In the midst of all of this, the dust of cloud rises. No one can see what's happening in the ring. The Quran describes the scene like this. Surah Al-Ahzab, verse number 10. Allah says that on the day when they attacked you from above and from below you, and the eyes began to roll. That's how scared they were. وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرِ And the hearts reach the throat. You know when you're absolutely terrified? You know when you're so scared, you can't even breathe anymore? That was the state of the Muslims on that day. The defeat of Ali ibn Abi Talib would have been a decisive defeat for Islam. End of the religion of God, which is why Rasulullah made the statement, he said, Allahumma, if you don't wish to be worshipped, in إِذَا كُنْتَ لَا تَشَأْ تُعْبَدْ فَلَنْ تُعْبَدْ you don't, If you don't wish for this religion to continue to be preserved, then this is the day. This will end Islam altogether. Then the dust settled, and everyone observed the scene. Amr ibn Wid was on the ground, Ali ibn Abi Talib standing over him with his sword dripping with the blood of Amr ibn Wid. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad ibn Muhammad. The Imam didn't even touch him, nor his armor, nor his possessions. And that's an important point because later on when the Imam returned, 
Umar ibn al-Khattab, of all the things that you could say to Ali ibn Abi Talib, of instead of trying to justify why didn't you go and fight, he said to the Imam, why didn't you take his shield? This is a unique shield. It's worth this and this. Arabs speak of the legendary shield of Amr ibn Awad. The Imam said, I didn't want to take any of his possessions. What are you talking about? Instead, the Imam came back. When he returned, listen to this. He recited another poem. He said, Ana Ali I am Ali, the one who possesses this sword. I am the one who holds the pond on the day of judgment. I am the brother of Rasulullah. I have a sign from the messenger. He told me when he wrapped his turban around my head, He told me that you are my brother, the one who has unparalleled virtues, and after me you will be my Imam. Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, he says that when this event unfolded and Ali beat Amr ibn Wid, I was reminded of a verse in the Holy Quran. He said, مَا شَبَّهْتُ قَتْلَ عَلِيٍّ عَمْرًا إِلَّا بِقَوْلِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى فَهَزَمُوهُمْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَقَتَلَ دَاوُودُ جَالُوتِ He said, I was reminded of the battle between David and Goliath. This is Ali who defeated the entire camp of the idolaters. Not just Amr ibn Awad, which is why when the Imam killed Amr, the camp of the idolaters simply packed up and turned back to where they came from. Their computers all were fried up. Their brains couldn't think of another strategy. Their entire strategy was based on Amr, defeating the Muslims, humiliating them, breaking their spirit. That obviously didn't work. So, let's hear what the other side has to say about all of this. One of the most sinister, most evil, and most common methods that they've employed in trying to downplay and trivialize the virtues of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, is what I'd like to refer to as redaction. Right? Which I'll get to in a moment. Another methodology that they've employed, another evil ploy that they've used, is that they say that they take the story out of its context. As I said earlier, they try to take away the exclusive nature of the Imam's virtues. So they tell the story. And they say that on the day of Ahzab, قَتَلَ عَلِيٌّ عَمْرَ بْنِ وِدِّ الْعَامِرِ Ali killed Amr. Before, Muslims were all sitting down like a bird was nesting on their heads. The Prophet kept telling them, why don't you go and fight? Amr ibn Wid's voice going hoarse. All of these things, they will redact them. Decontextualize the story. Omit some of the important elements in it. So then, at the end, it comes down to Ali killed Amr. That's it. it. There's not much of a virtue in that. Am I right? So that's one argument or one method they've employed. The other, and I've read this in some of their books, it's unbelievable. They say Amr ibn Wid was an old man. At the time of the Battle of Ahzab, he was in his 70s. Ali ibn Abi Talib was a young man. He was muscular, he was well built, he was fit, right? And so there's not much courage needed to fight a senior citizen, someone who's in his 70s or 80s or 90s even. Well, here's my question to you. If that's the case, if Amr ibn Wid wasn't much of a challenger, why would the Quran describe the scene as saying your hearts reached your throats? Why is it that no one got up and said, well, that's an elderly man. I'll just poke him with my spear and he'll fall over to his death. Why? Why was everyone so silent? Why were they so quiet? What happened to all these brave people? 
if he truly was such a trivial challenger. Ibn Taymiyyah uses another methodology. He says the hadith is weak. Classic, classic way to reject any hadith that you're uncomfortable with. And we know that Ibn Taymiyyah was incredibly uncomfortable when it came to the virtues of the Ahlul Bayt salam. So the hadith doesn't have a strong chain of narrators. They've employed this technique for centuries. Unfortunately, we now have people who call themselves Shia who employ the same technique. You tell them a hadith and it's like, but what's the chain of the hadith? What do you even know about chains, man? Other than the chain you hang around your neck, looking like a girl. What do you know about chains? What do you know about narrators? What do you know about authenticating reports? Honestly, what do you know about these things? Are you a scholar? Do you even know any of the individuals who reported the hadith? Pack up and leave, go home. And so this is another tragedy that we face in this day and age. Ibn Taymiyyah says the hadith's chain is weak. However, the hadith is reported by Al-Hakim and Naysaburi in his Mustadrak with an authentic chain that they acknowledge as an authentic chain. He says Ahmad ibn Hanbal didn't narrate it with an authentic chain. Who cares? Find it in another book. That's number one. Number two, he says the other problem with the hadith is how could Rasulullah say at the conclusion of the duel between Amir al muminin and Amr ibn Wid make his famous proclamation in other versions of the hadith, He said, how could the Prophet say this? That the strike of Ali ibn Abi Talib is better than the acts and deeds and worships of both the ins, humans, as well as the jinn. Every single sentient being. No matter how much we worship Allah, no matter how much we worship, no matter how much charity we give, no matter how many good deeds we amass, the single strike of Ali was better than all of this combined. How could the Prophet say this when there were worse enemies than Amr ibn Wid, the likes of Abi Jahl? That's his argument. And the answer to that is obvious. Who are you to object to the statement of Rasulullah. Abu Jahl was worse than Amr Wid or better than Amr Wid or better than Abu Bakr or worse than Abu Bakr. All these are irrelevant. Rasulullah recognizes, as does the Quran, the decisive nature of this battle and says that the strike of Ali ibn Abi Talib was better than the acts of worship of everyone in existence because had it not been for that strike, Islam would not exist. The entirety of religion and revelation would cease to exist. Ibn Abi al-Hadid says something interesting. He says, he quotes his teacher, whose name was Abi al-Hudayl or Abi al-Hadil. He says, one day they asked my teacher, again a Sunni. They said to him, who's better? Abu Bakr and Umar or Ali ibn Abi Talib? He said, stop, stop. A single strike of Ali ibn Abi Talib in the battle of Ahzab was better than the actions of every living creature, including all of the companions and the Ansar and the Muhajireen. A single strike of Ali was better than all of them put together, let alone Abu Bakr himself. Are you joking? Now, we've run out of time, unfortunately. I wanted to mention more examples. Inshallah, maybe we'll be able to do that tomorrow of how the actions, the virtues, the merits of Amir al muminin were exclusive to him. Exclusive. Rasulullah made sure that they were exclusive. The battle of Khaybar is another classic example of that without going into detail. In Khaybar, Bukhari and Muslim, Muslim in particular, mentions the story. He says, Rasul an Abi Huraira, a guy who met the Prophet for two years, two years. Most Sunni ahadith are narrated from Abi Huraira and Aisha. Ali ibn Abi Talib was with Rasulullah since he was two years old. He has less traditions by far 
reported by the Sunni school than Abi Hurairah who only saw Rasulullah for two years. And the eighth year after Hijrah, Rasulullah died on the tenth year. He met the Prophet, he became a Muslim in the eighth year. But he has more hadith along with Aisha than all the other companions anyway. This is just one manifestation of the oppression that they forced upon Ali ibn Abi Talib. That his opinion, his quotes, his reports of Rasulullah are to be dismissed, but not Abi Hurairah, the guy who used to play with cats in the street. Abu Hurairah mentions the hadith in Sahih Muslim. He says, Rasulullah said that tomorrow I will give the flag, the standard, to a man, Yuhibullah wa Rasulah, wa Yuhibbuhullah wa Rasuluh. He loves God and his messenger, and God and his messenger love this man. So Ali ibn Abi Talib came, the Prophet gave him the standard. He said, go forward and conquer the fortress of Khaybar. End of the story. So you hear this as a non-Muslim, as a non-Shia, you read this report and what do you think to yourself? Okay, wow, Look, great story. Ali ibn Abi Talib went and fought and he won. But had the chance been given to Abu Bakr and Umar, it would be a completely different story because we know for a fact that Abu Bakr and Umar were better than Ali ibn Abi Talib, right? If they'd been given the chance, Rasulullah simply picked Ali ibn Abi Talib at random. Had he given it to Abu Bakr, you would have seen what Abu Bakr would have done. Am I right? Well, Al-Hakim al-Naysaburi tells the story in full. I'm sorry to say. He says that initially Rasulullah gave the standard to Abu Bakr. Go and fight. Prove yourself. You've had some stains in the past. We saw what happened to you in Uhud. I'll give you another chance. He goes with his companions, his troops, he's the commander. They go and quickly come back. يُجَبِّنُ أَصْحَابَهُ وَيُجَبِّنُونَهُ Allahu Akbar, what a scandal. Imagine an army goes off to battle, then they come back and the army, every single soldier, says that our commander was a coward. Ya Rasulullah, who did you send us with? What kind of a commander is this guy? I'm not saying this. I'm not saying this. Al-Hakim al-Naysaburi. His book, called Al-Mustadrak ala sahihain by the way, is a completion of Sahih Muslim and Bukhari. In other words, he knows the standard by which Muslim and Bukhari would authenticate hadiths. He knows the formula. He knows all the people that they consider to be reliable. He simply went out and found the contexts of many of these hadith that Bukhari and Muslim had conveniently redacted and omitted. He simply brought the rest of the hadith. That's his crime, right? Which is why now al Dhahabi and others say that he wasn't too careful with the authenticity of a hadith. Oh, we know why he wasn't too careful. Because he exposed you as fools. He showed your hypocrisy, even though he's one of you. So Al-Hakim al-Naysaburi says that when they got back, every single soldier said to the Prophet, this guy's a coward, Ya Rasulullah. He didn't even give us a chance. And of course, in return, he would reciprocate the insult and he would say, no, you are the cowards. I'm brave. If you were more you know, courageous, we would have been able to, to conquer the fortress. Fine. That's one guy completely eliminated and humiliated. Rasulullah said, Umar, come. You've got a bunch of dark stains in your history as well. Again, Uhud and all that. So I'll give you another chance. Take the standard, go fight. He went back before he even reached the fortress. They came running back to Rasulullah. Yujabbinu ashabahu wa yujabbinuna. Unbelievable. What a scandalous situation. His troops were saying he's a coward, he's saying his troops are cowards. Then Rasulullah said, tomorrow I shall give the standard to a man who loves God and his messenger. And God and his messenger love him. Then listen to this. He attacks and goes forward, but doesn't retreat and run from battle, which is a reference to those two. Redact these two parts 
and you end up with Ali ibn Abi Talib was sent to Khaybah, he conquered it, came back, clap, clap. But with this context, it shows the exclusive nature of the virtues of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Abu Bakr said, he said, I've never desired to be given a position like the day I wanted to be this man that Rasulullah said God loves him, he loves God, he attacks, he doesn't retreat. But you were already given a chance for crying out loud. How many times do you want to subject yourself to humiliation? Honestly, anyone else would have just bowed their head in shame and gone back home. So that night, they all spent it awake. Historians once again go into detail. They all stayed up waiting to know who this person is as if it's a surprise. We, we've come 14 centuries later and having known a little bit about the virtues of Amir al muminin and we know who it's going to be. But the reason perhaps they were unsure as to who that person would be is because Amir al muminin was sick at the time. The Imam had marad, which is a sickness where his eyes become inflamed. Amir al muminin was so oppressed. One day he said this. He saw a man who was screaming in the middle of the marketplace. Ana mazloom, ana mazloom. The Imam said to him, come, come, come. Sit next to me. I've been oppressed since the day I was born. The Imam then gave him one example. He says, my brother Aqil had a disease in his eyes. Aqil was older than Amir al muminin by about 20 years, no less. So he didn't like medicines. He didn't like to be treated with medications in his eye. So he nagged and he's like, I don't want this. So they would put the medication in my perfectly healthy eye so that Aqil would agree to have the medication poured in his eye. I've been oppressed since the day I was born. Subhanallah. Inni mazloomun bi'adadil hajari wal madar. I'm oppressed the size and the number of every pebble in the world. That's the level of my oppression. So the Imam had an eye infection when the Prophet said, bring me Ali. Everyone was shocked. Ali is sick. So they brought Amir al muminin The Prophet blew into the eyes of Ali and they were immediately, instantaneously healed. The Imam then gave him the standard and the rest, as they say, is history. He put everyone to shame. And yet, they treated him the way they did, to the point that Amir al muminin would say salam to people and they wouldn't even rep reply to him. Fatima al-Zahra, I might have mentioned this before. Amir al muminin came to the house. She was ill, she was in her deathbed. As soon as she saw the Imam, she began crying. Why do you cry, Ya Umm al Hassan? She said, Ya Abu al Hassan. Inni abki ala wahdatika wa ghurbatika min ba'di. I'm crying because of your strangeness, your loneliness after me. Allahu Akbar. Fatima al Zahra, whose ribs are broken, whose every breath brings excruciating pain, who was oppressed herself, she's crying for the oppression of Amir al muminin And so, on these nights, when Amir al muminin was dying, he had been dying since the day they ambushed the home of Fatima. Since that day, Amir al muminin died. His earthly death came on these nights. He was now ready to meet Fatima al Zahra once again. He was yearning for this. He was longing for the moment of his death. Which is why he looked up at the last moment of his life. He looked up in the direction of a corner of the room. And he said, Assalamu alaikum ya malaikata rabbi. Peace be upon you, O messengers of my Lord. He then said, Limithli hadha falyamal al amilun. Let those who do things do what they can for this. This is what you get 
when you live a life of virtue, a life of religiosity, a life of faith. The Imam then started to say salam to Rasulullah who had come to greet him, to his uncle Hamza, to his brother Ja'far, and I'm sure Fatima al-Zahra was also there, expecting her husband Amir al-Mu'mineen to go. But before he departed, Amir al-Mu'mineen gathered his children and he began to give them words of advice, to impart his will. So he spoke to his son, Imam al-Hasan, then Imam al-Hussein, then Lady Zainab, then to Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya, until the Imam reached his son, al-Abbas ibn Ali. One of the things the Imam said to him was this, he said to him, Bunay, my sweetheart, my son, there will come a day when you are presented with water, but your brother is thirsty. Allahu Akbar. That day came when they called upon Abbas. Shamr ibn Dhul Jawshan cried. He said, Aina banu ukhtina? Where are our nephews? Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas refused to respond to him. Imam al-Hussein said, reply to him, wa in kana fasiqa. Imam al-Hussein wants people to know who Abbas was. So he said, go and see what he has to say. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas said, naam Sayyidi, yes my master. He never addressed his brother as brother. It was always Sayyidi, Mawlai. He came into this world and his mother Ummul Banin raised him and his brothers to be servants of their brother, to be martyred in his sake, to be water bearers for his children. Al-Abbas went to Shamr ibn al Jawshan. He said to him, what do you want? He said, I have good news. I bear glad tidings. I have a pledge of immunity from the governor for you and your three brothers. You don't have to get killed here. You can take this immunity and go home. How did Abu al-Fadl respond to him? He said, May God curse you and your immunity. You wish to give us immunity when the son of the Prophet's daughter is unsafe and has no immunity. Which is why on the day of Ashura, after everyone had been killed, Abil Fadl al-Abbas came to his brother. He said to him, Sayyidi ya Aba Abdullah, laqad daqa sadri min haula al-munafiqeen. My chest feels constricted because of these hypocrites and what they've done. In other words, I can't take it anymore. Would you give me permission to go and avenge our martyrs from them? Let me go and fight them. Imam al Hussein said to him, Akhi Abel Fad, my little brother Abbas. أنت حامل لوائي أنت كبش كتيبتي You are my standard bearer You are my one man army If you get killed I will be left without an army The women will have no protector anymore Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas kept asking and pleading in the end he might have been saying to the Imam Ya Aba Abdullah I can't bear to hear the voices of the little girls your daughter saying Al-Atash 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 so the Imam said to him In kana wa la bud fajlib liha ula il atfal sharbatan min al ma if you must go then go and fetch water for these children. Abil Fadl al-Abbas headed towards the battlefield. He reached the water. 
he might have remembered what Amir al Mu'mineen told him on his deathbed. He threw the water back into the stream. He then came out of the river. The enemy were murmuring and whispering to each other if he drinks, that will be the end of all of us. Why didn't he drink? Why didn't he quench his thirst? He then responded to their questions, saying, Ya nafsu min ba'd al wa ba'dahu ma kunti aw takuni. O Abbas, you are nothing after Hussein. How could you taste the water when he is thirsty? He headed towards the tent. Aywa wayla, ajarakumullah ya mu'mineen. He had the water container. He also was fighting with the sword as he headed towards the battlefield. An arrow reached his eye, blinding it. A man struck his right arm. Another struck his left left arm. Al-Abbas was still intent on reaching the battle. All he cared about was the water. That is when an arrow pierced the container and spilled the water to the ground. This is when Abbas simply stopped. فَوَقَفَ الْعَبَّاسُ مُتَحَيِّرًا How does he return to the tent? without water? How does he fight without hands? How does he proceed without his eye? <laughs> عمد الحديد بكربلاء خسف القمر That is when Abbas called out to his brother for the first time he said to him أخي أدرك أخاك Brother come to me Imam Hussein rushed to his brother They began running away from him like a raging eagle chasing its prey. The Imam said to them, Where do you flee when you have killed my brother? When the Imam reached him, he called out, الآن انكسر ظهري وشمت بي عدوي لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون